quick uh, reminder that James, the Lord's brother, is writing this letter. Good guess of when is, is A.D. 45. He's writing to Jewish Christians who are outside of Palestine. Most of them, it seems, were poor. And they were being oppressed in some way by their unbelieving rich neighbors. They also were experiencing a number of ethical problems. Acting in ways contrary to how God would have them act. And James writes this letter to strengthen them in what they're enduring and also to instruct them uh, in a number of particular ways. In chapter 1, verses 2 to 12, you remember he, in, he encourages his readers to endure this oppression that they're ex experiencing by the rich. And he does that in several ways. He first he reminds them of the, of the spiritual benefits that are available and going through and that accompany such trials. Verses 5 through 8 of chapter, chapter 1, he encourages them to endure this oppression by reminding them that the wisdom that is especially needed in times of trials is available for the asking. And then in verses 9 through 12 of chapter 1, he encourages them in their trials by contrasting. He does this, uh, you know, this eschatological reversal. He contrasts uh, their position and glorious future in Christ with the low position and the bleak future of those who are oppressing them. He lets them know, see, that a time is coming. You see, when this will all be set right. And so you have all of that encouraging them uh, as they undergo these difficulties. Then in verses 13 to 18, he warns them. So he first encourages them about the trials. And then he issues some warnings to them with regard to these trials. And he warns them against slandering God during trials as it's easy to fall into doing that. That when you're, you're getting the hammer or you're having difficulties, when you're being persecuted, when you're being oppressed, it's easy to start to think that God is against me. And so he warns them when you're undergoing these things not to slander God during the trials. In verses 13 to 15, he tells them not to claim when they're being tested that what God is really trying to do is get them to sin. God's motivation in this is he's trying to get me to sin. That's not what God wants. And he makes clear that if they sin, it's not because God willed it. Rather, it's because they failed to control their own desires. That's where the responsibility lies. It's not that God is sitting here and pushing you to it. If you sin, it's because you fail to control your own desires. The responsibility for sin rests on their shoulders. And I think it's important to see He's saying this to people who are being oppressed and persecuted. And you could easily say to them, oh, I, you know, I understand. It's really not your fault. Right? That's the message of our society. And without downplaying the fact that difficulties and hardships pressure people and do those kinds of things, the question is responsibility. And ultimately, it falls on those who, who don't control their desires and he ends that by saying it's serious business because sinning, yielding to temptation, is the first step on a road that leads to death. See, this isn't just, oh, you know, it's, it's no big deal. It's serious because that's the first step on a road that leads to death. If sin is allowed to become fully grown, you see, if it's allowed to become master of our lives, it will result in condemnation. And that's where we ended last week, and I want to pick up with verses 16 to 18. He says, do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good act of giving and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is neither change nor a shifting shadow. Having willed, he brought us into being by the word of truth, so that we might be a kind of first, fruit, first fruits of his creatures. See, he he's tells them here, look, in this idea, in, in warning them against slandering God during their trials. Okay, he first tells them, look, uh, you, you're not to, to say that you're being, that God's motivation, he's against you, he's an enemy, he's trying to get you to sin. You're not to say that. And here he tells them, look, God seeks only our good. That is who God is. He seeks only our good. He urges them not to allow the pain of their trials to deceive them about God's commitment to their welfare, as verse 13 indicates, was a danger. He says, none of you who are being tested should say, God's tempting me. 
Okay? So here he tells them, look, don't be deceived. Don't be deceived into thinking that God is somehow not for you. That he's somehow not committed to your welfare. God is not an adversary. You know, the name adversary, that's Satan. God is not an adversary. He seeks only to bless them. That's what he's about. That's his motivation. That's what he's doing. He seeks only to bless them. As evidenced by the fact that he's the source of every good act of giving and of every perfect gift. Even the way he refers to himself here, he refers to God as the father of lights that speaks of his good creation. You see, so he says here that, look, don't be deceived by that. God is the source of every good act of giving and of every perfect gift. He seeks only to bless you, as evidenced by those facts. He is, God is their supreme benefactor. He's their supreme benefactor, and his commitment to their welfare is unchanging because he himself is unchanging. So this is what he wants them to see. Don't be deceived when you're undergoing trials and think that somehow God is now your enemy and he's trying to get you to sin. That's not true. God is your supreme benefactor. He seeks only to bless you. So I see him as they're undergoing these trials warning them about slandering God during the trials by claiming that God is trying to get me to sin. That's his motivation. Well, that's a terrible thing to say about God who gave his son for you. You see, and then he says, that's not true at all. God seeks only your welfare. That is what he's after. He is your supreme benefactor. And the ultimate expression of his good giving is his giving to them new birth through the gospel, right? He sits here, having willed, he brought us into being by the word of truth. This idea, see, that the ultimate giving is his bringing them into being through the gospel so that they may be what? A kind of first fruit, a kind of sacred offering of his creatures. So here we have an example of God's tremendous giving. What did he do? He brought you into being by the word of truth. How can you think that this one is turned against you and is your enemy is seeking to get you to sin? So he tells them in the turmoil of persecution, of hostility, of oppression, don't allow that to cause your focus on God to get blurred, distorted, where you start to see him as someone ungodly. Because God is for you. He is committed to you. That's what I say last week. You know, God, the cross of Christ says, through all the fog of pain and suffering and hardship and persecution and all of that, that message of the cross shouts through all of that and says, I'm committed to you to death. However it may look, whatever doubts you may have, I'm committed to you to death. And so you see this, and he's, he's telling them that, and he wants them to understand that. That God has given them that. Then he says, now we have a a move here. At least I'm giving you the way that I understand the flow of thought. As I said, there are many people that think these are kind of isolated discourses. I see it as there's a continuity of of thought that goes from one thing to another. As though it's it's a genuine letter. And so he's been telling them. Look, he says, look. He's first, you see, he's telling them, as I said in the outline there, he's giving them here encouragement and instruction for trials. He encourages them to endure the oppression by the rich. Then in 13 to 18, he warns them against slandering God. And now he's going to call them to be doers of the word during trials. All of these things tied to the trials they are undergoing as poor Christians being oppressed by their unbelieving rich neighbors. So now he's going to call them, and I'm struck by this because it's so different than how we would do it. Because somebody who's getting uh, the hammer and having difficult times, we would be very, very reluctant to call them to repentance. See, we would would focus more on, no, no, they're having a hard time, that's being um, mean to them. But James, while they're being oppressed... He doesn't excuse their failure and he says, you are Christians and you are called to holy living. And he'll do this and that's what he's going to do right here. He tells them in verse 19 to 25. He says, you know this, my beloved brothers, but let every man be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For a man's anger does not produce the righteousness of God. 
Therefore, having put away all moral filth and abundance of evil, accept with humility the implanted word that is able to save your souls and be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Because if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks at his face in a mirror. For he noticed himself and went away and immediately forgot what he was like. But the man who looked into the perfect law, the law of freedom, and remained, not being a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in his doing. Now here James is telling, look, he's, he calls them to be doers of the word, and I think he's calling them to be doers of the word, particularly with regard to their hostility toward their oppressors. And he's going to do this in a couple of ways. He first here, he says, look, with regard to their anger toward their oppressors. He calls them to be doers of the word with regard to their anger. James readers, they knew that they, that they were to be Christ-like in their handling of conflicts. He says, you know this, my beloved brothers. They knew they were to be Christ-like in the handling of, their, of conflicts. But some of them were failing in that regard in terms of how they were dealing with the rich oppressors. You see, they were, they were failing in that regard, in that conflict with the rich oppressors. They were getting sinfully angry. Now, there is a form of anger that's not sinful. We know that because the Lord Jesus Christ, who is sinless, is said in text to have gotten angry. We typically characterize that as a righteous indignation. There is a kind of anger at violating God's will. But there is sinful anger where it's, you know, more personally, uh, you got some nerve doing that to me, treating me like that. So there isn't, there isn't form of anger that's not sinful, but there clearly is a anger that is sinful, and that's what these people are engaging in. They're getting sinfully angry at the people who are oppressing them, and James commands them to live up to what they know because anger is contrary to the righteousness that God demands of his people. Now, you talk about getting down to it. You want to talk about getting down, Christianity getting down to transformation? Oh, you can't help be angry. We need to go ahead and everybody be angry. That's therapy. Just go ahead. Run wild with anger. Well, the Bible says that that's contrary to the righteousness that God demands. Anger is, as Jesus explained in Matthew uh, chapter 5, verse 21 and 22, it is murderous in principle. Anger is murderous in principle. You see, it's a sense of hostility that finds its ultimate expression where? In killing somebody. That's, that's the full vent, the full manifestation of anger is killing someone. It's an, it's an extrapolation where I'm angry and then I give vent to that. And what is the manifestation of that? It is my killing another human being. It is murderous in principle. In Galatians 5, 20, Paul lists anger among works of the flesh. Colossians chapter 3, verse 8, he listed among the things that have no place in a Christian's life. Now, what do we do with that? You see, this is the kind of stuff, you know, oh, Christianity, it's just all the same. Christianity is a deep, transforming religion. It is not something you sit here and say, well, you know, it's just... Uh, lightweight, superficial stuff that doesn't transform people. No, it does. It gets way down. Even to something that we sit here and we're tempted to say, well, you can't help that. You know, you just have to go with that. The Spirit of God transforms people, and here he's telling them, listen, you understand, you knew that you were to be Christ-like in the handling of these conflicts, but they're failing in doing that. See, note the, the explanation here in the, verse 20. He, the explanation in, in 120 of the proverbial saying in the second part of 19, he says, but every man be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger, this proverbial saying that he gives. And then he says in 120, he says, for because a man's anger does not produce the righteousness of God. And he shows and makes clear that anger is the focus of James' concern. Right? He says, you know, my beloved, let every man be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger for a man's anger. You see, what's he after? What's he focusing on? His focus is their anger. Their anger at, at the people who are mistreating them. 
They're upset. They're being sinfully angry toward them. And James doesn't spell out here. You say, well, he doesn't say that it, the, the object of it is the people who are oppressing him. He doesn't spell that out here, that their anger here or their hostile speech in verses 26 and 27 or the preference that they're showing for the rich in chapter 2. He doesn't spell out that those things are related to their oppression, but it's a reasonable conclusion. That that's what's driving this, as Peter David says in his commentary, he says, on the one hand, the church naturally felt resentment against the rich. I understand this. I relate to this. You're getting oppressed by some people. Naturally, you're going to feel this resentment. David goes on. He says, on the other hand, if a wealthy person entered the church or was a member, there would be every reason to court him. You see, so I think it's what's behind both of these things, and I'll elaborate on that when we get to chapter 2 about how it fits in with their, uh, with the, uh, you know, kowtowing to the rich person. One wouldn't expect James to refer to the oppression in this context, at least the way I'm looking at this. I wouldn't expect him to spell that out because that doesn't diminish their personal responsibility to repent of the sin. You see, as he said in 1, 14 to 15, he says, what's behind the sin? It, it's your desire that you're not checking. So he's not interested in, in saying, well, these are the circumstances that can minimize that or something. That's not relevant to his call to what? Repent. I understand there are factors and things that are pressuring you, and they are enhancing the likelihood of your succumbing to this particular temptation, but that doesn't matter in terms of you need to repent. Right? It, that doesn't excuse it. That doesn't say, well, okay, in that case it's not sinful. In that case it's perfectly fine. No. You still need to repent of it, right? Whatever produced it, whatever was behind it, you're being sinfully angry in your response. And he calls them then that they need to repent. Then he says here that having repented of all evil. You see here where he says, therefore, having put away all moral filth and abundance of evil. And you could, you could take that, by the way, I, I take that, there's a participle there, and I take it in translation as a circumstantial participle reflected in that, what I have up there. You could take it as imperatival, which some translations do, where they say, therefore, put away. But I think that misses the point. I think the point is, he sits here and he's telling him, listen, having repented of all evil when they initially received the gospel, the soul-saving word. Having repented of all evil when they initially received the gospel, they must continue on that path with regard to their anger. They must humbly submit to the ethical demands of the implanted word. This word that they received, this gospel message that they took in, they must humbly submit to the ethical demands of that implanted word, submit to the law of freedom that calls them to what? Overcome evil with good. To overcome evil with good and to love their neighbors themselves. You see in Romans 12, 21, overcome evil with good. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 12 to 13, Paul says we're cursed, we bless. And we just shake our head and go, that's crazy. Well, that's how radical Christianity is. Why do you think it exploded? It is because people's lives are so radically transformed that people said, Whoa, what is this? Who has gotten a hold of these people that they now act this way? Nobody would be like that. God working through people. That's what he's doing. Okay, well, that's what happened. There was reality. That gave a context for preaching. That when people saw the transformed lives of people with things that we go, Whoa. How can that be? How can somebody be transformed so deeply? Be a new person. Act like that. Well, when the world saw that, they said, what is this? And that was a context then that they preached the message of Christ. De Peter Davids observes in his commentary, he says, the call to receive or accept the word of the gospel which they have already implanted in them sounds contradictory. But the stock characteristic of the language of receiving the word, meaning accepting and acting on it, as in the examples above, and the fact that gospel consists of both a word about Jesus and ethical content, which is James's main concern, point to the sense of this idea of accept 
the soul-saving word that is already implanted, except in what sense? I've already received it. Except it in this sense, in the, point to the sense of act upon the word you accepted at conversion. You see? Act on it. This is what I think he's telling them to do. When you became a Christian, you put all those things away. That was part of the call of Christ. Now you need to continue to submit to the ethical demands that are a part of that gospel. And you need to repent of your sinful anger toward those who are oppressing you. Now that's tough. That's preaching and I'm telling you how it would be received in our culture. It would be received, oh, you can't say that. What we need to do is talk about all the stuff and all the reasons they have for being angry. And there may be a place for that. But James, the Spirit of God in James says, all that aside, and without belittling it, and without taking away the fact that circumstances can push you to things, you're still responsible. And you need to stop it. You need to repent, and you need to come and... and Submit to that word that's put within you. And this idea is the law of freedom in chapter 1, verse 25. I'm wobbling up here. The law of freedom in chapter 1, verse 25, and in chapter 2, verse 12, it's called the, the royal law in chapter 2, verse 8. And it's there, it's identified with, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You see, so this idea of the, the law of freedom in 125. And at 2.12, in chapter 2, verse 8, it's called the royal law. It's identified what you shall love your neighbor as yourself. See, there, that's the command that what Christ singled out. Right? In Matthew chapter 24, 22, verses 34 to 40. Matthew 22, 34 to 40. He, he singled out that command as a summary of interpersonal ethical obligations. That was it. That was the heart of it. You know the greatest command? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. So here and the interpersonal ethical obligations are summarized in what? Love your neighbor as yourself. You see, as kingdom participants, he says, listen, you have to be doers of kingdom righteousness. Not simply hearers. Okay, isn't that what he's saying? What, what do you think all this stuff is? He said, and be doers of the word, not hearers only deceiving yourselves. Right? He says, you have to be doers. You have to put these things into practice. You have to let this gospel message that you took into your heart, you have to let it have its ramifications in your life. It must pour out. It must spill out. So he's telling them that, listen, you have to be doers of kingdom righteousness, not hearers only. If you think this is unusual, what do we see in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21? Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Now, did he say that or not? He said it. Luke 6, he says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Do you think there's something big about getting your lips and your mouth and all the tongue to say, to make sounds, Lord, Lord? If there's no truth and behind that confession, it's meaningless. It's not the sounds. It's that the sounds represent a truth. And he says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? I'll show you what he's like who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice. Puts them into practice. Does them. He says, he's like a man building a house who dug down deep, laid a foundation on a rock. When a flood came, a torrent struck that house, but could not shake it because it was well built. But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice, sounds exactly like what this guy's talking about, James. Hears my words and does not put them into practice, like a man who built a, a house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck the house, it collapsed and its destruction was complete. See, those who ignore the ethical demands of the gospel, who hear the word... But don't obey it. They're deceiving themselves about their relationship with God. What does John say? We know John. You know, John's all about love. Okay? What does John say repeatedly in, in the letters? He says, and by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. The one who says I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is what? He's a liar. And in this one the truth is not. 
Okay, well, this is what James is saying. Now, does this mean, I always have to have a footnote, I get tired of doing it, but I know how people are. Okay, now what does this mean? Does this mean then that I have to sit here and perfectly obey, and if I don't, I'm going to hell, and I have to be a spiritual neurotic, and I have to chew my fingers, oh, oh, I'm not going to make it, I'm not going to make it. Is that what he's talking about? Or is he talking about there has to be a genuineness? There has to be a real, bona fide surrender of life to Christ. That's what he's talking about. It cannot be, oh, Jesus, I love Jesus, but I'm going to completely ignore his call on my life. If I do that, then my profession that he is Lord is bogus, right? This doesn't seem hard to me. If, if it's real when I say Jesus is Lord, well, how do you respond to the Lord? If he's Lord, I seek to honor him by living how he would call me to live. And that's what James is saying to them. He wants them to do that. He wants them to come and be the people that God wants them to be. And here I think you see the first indication of this distortion of Paul's teaching. He's going to address it head on in chapter 2. But Paul's teaching was twisted by some people into the idea that obedience is irrelevant to faith. It's simply some kind of intellectual understanding and that if I believe certain facts are true, that's the end of the story. My life and what flows out of that has nothing to do with anything. All that matters is, am I convinced intellectually that these facts are true? Well, that's not true. You see, certainly you have to be convinced of those, that those facts are true, but you have to give yourself to those facts. You have to submit to living in accordance with that truth. It has to be real. And so I see you get the first hints here of this distortion of Paul's teaching. It's of no value to become aware of what you need to do if you promptly forget it. You see, if you sit here, oh yeah, I see I have this tremendous zit on my nose. Uh, then I just walk away. And I forgot what this revealed to me. Well, what good is it? Because I forgot what I now here I am scaring people. That's just, take, that's just taken from a life circumstance. Okay? But I mean, that's the point. I look at this word that reveals truths, and I just sit here, and if I just go away, and then I don't implement i don't put into practice the thing that says oh this has to change this is off this is ugly this is wrong i just walk away he says what good is that and he's telling them this in the context of calling them to be the people that god wants them to be god's blessing is on the one who obeys the ethical demands of the gospel he says but the man who looked into the perfect law the law of freedom and remain not being a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work this one will be blessed in his doing, what did Jesus say about if you, the one who hears my words and does them, puts them into practice? What is he? He's built on the rock. Person who doesn't, what's he? Well, he's vulnerable, you see. And so that's just what he's saying here. God's blessing is on the one who has genuine faith, a faith that is manifested in life. It's, it's blessing is on the one who obeys the ethical demands of the gospel who obeys what Paul in Galatians chapter 6 verse 2 refers to as the law of Christ. Why? Not, not because obeying merits God's blessings. Do you understand that? It is not because I obey and therefore I am worthy of something in your sight. Not at all. See, not for that reason, but because the faith on which God bestows his grace biblical saving faith it includes a commitment to obey it includes a surrender to the truth of who God is and what he has done in Jesus Christ and that commitment necessarily inevitably finds expression in a person's life you can't tell me somebody whose life is devoted to something you've said look this guy, what, he, he got all, you know, caught up in, uh, pick something. He's now, his whole life is geared around environmentalism. Well, do you think that commitment will manifest itself in the person's life? How they talk, what they read, what they watch? Well, of course it will. Why? Because you can't break them apart or this is bogus. Well, that's the idea. I don't know why this is difficult. There has to be a genuine surrender. 
You can, let me put it, you can't be a phony. Can I say that? I mean, that, that, you can't be a phony. That may be able to communicate. A pretender, a poser, okay? You have to be genuine. You have to say, Lord, I see that you call me to live this way, and there's a hunk of me that wants to go and sit on the throne and be the Lord of my life, but I'm going to submit to you. Okay, well, that turning then will then manifest itself in our lives. Will it do so perfectly? Are you saying you're not sinful? I am not saying I am not sinful. I am sinful. But I understand the difference between sinning within a commitment and just saying, I don't care. You understand that in your children? I pointed it out many times. The child coming to you, trying, walking, stumbling, stumbling. Come on, come on, come on. When the child gets there, what do you do? You don't slap them across the room. That's different from the child that sits here and you say, come on, come on. And he goes, there's a different spirit. One is a stumbling and a submission. The other is rebellion. And so all I'm saying to you is that there is there an essential aspect of Christianity is the call to give your life. It's not just, hey, come get dunked in water. You can just get dunked in water. You have to be called to surrender your life. And when you're ready to do that, then you're ready to be dunked in water. You see, that's the call. That's the call that he puts here. All right, he now, in 26 and 27, he says, If anyone considers himself to be religious while not bridling his own tongue but deceiving his own heart, this one's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and, okay, that's my emphasis, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. What's going on here? Okay, their anger against their oppressors was, often, was as is often the case, this hostility, this resentment, this anger that I had for people who were doing this, this anger was accompanied by hostile speech, attacking speech, slander, whatever. And rather than being convicted of their sin in that regard, they deceived themselves into thinking they were pious despite their sinful speech. You see, we're over here, we're getting oppressed, and we're just railing against these people. And they had deceived themselves into thinking they were pious despite their sinful speech. And James flatly says that this type of religion, a religion that disassociates faith from life, is worthless. A religion that disassociates faith from life is worthless. That turns Christianity simply into, well, I think these things. I think these things, therefore, uh, I have the benefit of the great sin cleanser in the sky. I think these things. I will allow that thought to have no effect on whether I will abstain from doing something that I'm tempted to do. No, 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 I'm going to do what I want to do. I thought you said Jesus is Lord, you see? And so here they're deceiving themselves about this. They're apparently just ripping on people. Engaging in sinful speech, and he says here, if anyone considers himself to be religious while not bridling his own tongue, but deceiving his own heart. So this is what they're doing. They're convincing themselves that they are pious despite their sinful speech, and James says nonsense. You divorce life from faith, and that kind of religion is absolutely worthless. And the addressees, they apparently, what it looks like they're doing to me is that they magnify the sin of their oppressors, their failure to care for the poor. See, epitomized by orphans and widows. You see, so here they're getting oppressed by people who are these rich, unbelieving neighbors who are oppressing these uh, poor Jewish Christians. And what do they do? They are magnifying the sin of the oppressors in not caring for the poor, in not taking seriously God's concern for the poor symbolized, epitomized in that statement, orphans and widows. They were in the ancient world the epitome of those who were powerless, poor. And so they apparently were very quick 
to point out God's will on, on the oppressors. That they weren't, in fact, they weren't uh, caring for the poor. While they're minimizing or ignoring their own contamination by the world in the form of anger and evil speech. They gave themselves a pass. They focused on the oppressors. But James is writing to them. <laughs> James is writing to them. And so they're sitting there giving, ourselves, they're giving themselves a pass, an exemption, and he's writing to them. And this explains, see, James' emphasis on their being doers of the word. Why? Because they were exempting themselves. They were giving themselves a pass. He says, look, you have to be doers rather than just hearers of the word, as he said in, in 22 to 24. And it also explains the references to their self-deception in verse 22 and verse 26. So here they are engaging in this kind of activity, justifying it, focusing on the sin of their oppressors. And James comes in and he says, you have to repent of this sinful speech in which you're engaging. I don't, but you don't understand. Do you know who they are and how they You have to repent of this sinful speech in which you're engaging. I understand all these things. The Spirit of God is well aware of the pressures they're facing. But he still calls them here that they have to repent. David says, he says, it's also clear that orphans and widows were typical examples for all who suffered distress and oppression. So when I tell you that's a, that, that epitomizes the poor and the suffering. Here you have somebody who confirms that. Uh, James, see, he bursts their delusion of piety by reminding them, look, that pure and undefiled religion... It involves not only caring for the poor. He says religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this. Yes, it's true. That's correct. You're not wrong in pointing out that they are violating the will of God and not looking after orphans and widows and in oppressing the poor. That's true. But you have to also understand religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress. Yes, and that's why I said that. And to keep himself unspotted from the world. See, I think the whole focus on this is on the and. You see, yes, that's true, but that's all you want to talk about and all you want to see, and I want to talk about you. I want to talk about your life. I want to talk about what you need to change. And here he is. He's saying, you can't deceive yourselves. You can't be hearers only. You have to come and repent of the evil speech, the hostility, the sinful anger that you have, and the evil speech that is flowing out of that sinful anger toward the oppressors, you have to repent of that. So here he tells them, he calls them to do that. And then he, he deals now in, in chapter 2, verses 1 to 13, he deals with this preference that they have. He, he calls them to repentance with regard to this preference that they have for the rich. And here he, he just uh, identify the problem. You're, of course, familiar with all these texts. He says in chapter 2, verses 1 to 4, My brothers, keep the faith of our glorious Lord Jesus Christ without partiality. For if a man wearing gold rings and fine clothes comes into your meeting, and a poor man in shabby clothes also comes in, and you look at the one wearing the fine clothes and say, oh, You sit here in style. And to the poor man you say, You stand there or sit under, uh, under my footstool. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? See, some in James' audience, James's audience, apparently see fearing the power of the wealthy. Well, why would they fear the power of the wealthy? Well, why? <laughs> I can understand why they would. Why they would fear the power of the wealthy? Because the wealthy are calling the shots in the culture and they're oppressing them. Right? They're oppressing them. So fearing this power of the wealthy, they curried their favor even to the point of showing them preference when they appeared at meetings of the church, whether that be as visitors or as new converts, they wanted, we would say, to suck up to them. They wanted to curry their favor because they feared their power and they sought to ingratiate themselves to the wealthy at the expense of the poor. That's what they were trying to do. Douglas Moo says in his commentary, apparently the oppression they were experiencing at the hands of the rich, verses 6 and 7, had led to an excessive deference toward the rich and powerful that resulted in a slighting and demeaning of poorer people. 
You see, they became the ones who were really important. They were the ones who you had to really care about. They were the ones you had to really be interested. Do they like our congregation? You see, they were the ones. The other people, pfft, the riffraff. But we had to be super solicitous of the poor, I mean the wealthy, the powerful, but the poor we didn't really have to care about. This word that's translated partiality or favoritism, it's literally a receiving of the face, odd framing, that's why they just translated partiality. <laughs> but that's what it means. This idea of receiving of the face, it means to make judgments about people based on external appearances. And James applies this principle to the differences in dress and the, the, that reflect contrasting social and economic situations. He says, this guy comes in what? He's decked. Okay, he comes in and he's obviously a rich dude. He sits here, he's wearing gold rings, fine clothes, and you got this other guy in shabby clothes. And so it, it's these external things that are markers of these contrasting social and economic situations. And James commands them to practice their faith without that kind of partiality. You're not to do that. To discriminate on the basis of wealth is to judge by the unspiritual to judge by an unspiritual criterion, by the evil standards of this world. That's what you're doing when you do that. That is not a spiritual criterion, the fact the guy's got money. Good, fine, he's got money. But that is not some basis to sit here and say because he's got money, he then becomes great and he can trample on these other people. We don't care about them. We're going to elevate him at the expense of those people. We have to guard against favoring people who have status in the world's eyes. Every church has to watch that. You see? We can't be more solicitous of the doctor, the business tycoon, the politician, the pro athlete. <laughs> you know, I can only imagine what happened if some Hollywood person came in. Oh, oh. Whereas the common laborer, right. you see, he's like, he's no big deal. And that's, what he's, that's what's going on here. And James says, don't do this. And then he tells him about the foolishness of doing that. The foolishness of favoring the rich. He says in verses 5 to 7, listen, my beloved brothers. Did not God choose the poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? But you dishonored the poor man. Do not the rich exploit you? And do they not drag you into courts? Do they not blaspheme the excellent name that was invoked over you? He's saying, look, this is absolutely foolish for you to be doing this. And discriminating against the poor, you are acting contrary to God. He did not discriminate against the poor. But he chose them to be what? Rich in faith and to be heirs of the kingdom as evidenced by the number of poor believers in their congregation. He said, well, look at all these poor people. What do you think? God doesn't like them? Do you think he's not, he's not into them? He's holding his nose and says, I think I'll put up with these poor, this riffraff. I only wish I had more people with gold chains to come in. He says, it's foolish. That's not how God is and that's not how God has acted. You see, you see the same concept in, the, in uh, Paul in 1 Corinthians. The very same idea, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26 to 31. Paul here in that text, in that text, Lord willing, next week. Thank you. 